Hey YouTube Frogs, so I've been playing the second closed beta of Wuthering Waves for a solid 25 hours now, and wanted to share with you guys my honest review of the current game state and my perspective on the vast majority of its features. As a quick disclaimer, because this is a closed beta, all features talked about are subject to change upon full release. The game itself is an open world action RPG combining elements of many popular games you may be familiar with. It sports Genshin and Tower of Fantasy open world and exploration vibes, Punishing Grey Raven Perfect Evasion, Honkai Impact QTE, Honkai Star Wars Simulator Universe, an Abyss equivalent, a Pokemon slash Pokedex system, and even more that I may not have mentioned. If you've played any of those games, then the familiarity of Wuthering's basic systems will come naturally to you and boost your overall enjoyment because it's easy to get into. And to tackle the elephant in the room, let's just get it out of the way. Is this the Genshin killer? Well, let's be honest, the only thing that could really cripple Genshin now is itself and its community. Genshin's rise to fame was at the peak of COVID lockdown, and it's incredibly hard to reproduce those perfect conditions to have a game similar to it explode in the same or greater amount of success. So even if Wuthering Waves does execute every feature of its game perfectly, the free time that COVID lockdown granted tons of people unfortunately just doesn't exist anymore in this post era. That being said, I hope this game is successful on launch because it ramps up gameplay and combat to an exceptional degree the same way Punishing Grey Raven did for mobile games, and competition in this open world action RPG space is more than welcome. Let's all pray the developers go as hard as possible in marketing and advertising its official release. And so, while I may reference some Genshin features in this video because they help with formulating the overall review and giving you guys a basis of comparison, we will keep the Genshin does this, Genshin does that yapping to a minimum and review things from my objective experience with the game. I want to be as productive as possible and provide my feedback on what's solid and what needs improvement. So at the time of recording this review, which is only about a week into CBD2, this is the progress that I achieved. I reached Union level 31, which is about equivalent to AR45, I've experienced the endgame gear farming for Echoes, I've tried the Abyss equivalent, which is Tower of Adversity, I've tried out Simulated Universe equivalent, which is Elusive Realm, and I've attempted up to difficulty 4 of the hologram bosses, which are normal overworld bosses on steroids and have fight scenarios reminiscent of a Souls-like game. In these beefed up bosses, which are holograms, taking 2 to 3 hits is fatal, and their moveset requires anticipation, reaction speed, and split second decision making. So, in its current state, I've experienced nearly all of the features of the game and bashed my head against the most difficult content of the game that I've personally tested out. You can expect this review to be broken down into multiple sections, but as a disclaimer, I've placed heavier emphasis on combat, gearing, and the grinding aspect of the game and less on the lore, world building, and aesthetics. So expect each section to be longer or shorter accordingly. The first major thing you'll be exposed to are the graphics, sound production, music, and the features of the UI. Graphics are very solid and aesthetic, but heavily grey tinted overall. I expect this is to achieve an overall gloomy, post-apocalyptic vibe. This makes exploring the world a bit dull and cold at times, and makes each area feel a little too similar when they are evidently supposed to be different. Probably the feature people will most be excited for are the FPS options. In Wuthering Waves, you can set FPS to 120, and it does feel exceptionally smooth. For a game focused heavily on combat, this is a huge positive and definitely would be highly requested if not already in the game. Playing high intensity combat on 60 FPS would feel like a big oversight from a development standpoint. The range of graphics rendering and resolution is also very wide. You can expect the highest settings to make the gears turn on mid to high end PCs and completely toasting most mobile devices unless you've got like a mobile supercomputer or something. The lowest settings are more than feasible for essentially all devices. You'll definitely be able to find a balance for your PC and make sure to turn off motion blur because it's on by default and long playtime exposure with that will probably make you uncomfortable. Overall, 120 FPS option is king, the settings have solid range, and colors themselves are okay but seem a little dull and too grayscale. Closely related to the graphics is sound design. In my opinion, Wuthering Waves has surprisingly good sound design beyond just bass heavy EDM. While EDM is the BGM favorite of basically every high intensity boss fight, it also has its fair share of serene soft tracks depending on the region you're exploring. I think the appeal of these kind of tracks is to give you a contrast between ambient exploration where background music is much more peaceful and then switch into something with higher BPM and a deeper beat to indicate that you are in battle. Almost like a fight or flight response, so to speak. And for music, I think the best way to convey the experience is for you to listen to it. So here are two small snippets of tracks, one more peaceful and one more aggressive.
During combat itself, the sound designs to indicate perfect evasion, parry, QTE, and indicators for your abilities are all pretty solid. I think for some folks that are not used to how sound design is typically used in anime, might feel that these sounds are a little sharp and strong. But personally, I like their choices, and I feel the base structure is solid enough to have generally good impression for most players. Sound design in this aspect is in my opinion one of the features that if done really well, will increase the immersion of the player, if done just okay, won't be really noticeable, kind of like an afterthought, and if done poorly, will be very noticeable and complained about. Given that Wuthering Waves is developed by Kuro Games, which is also responsible for PGR, sound design for combat, in my opinion, is in good hands. PGR has some of the best combat sound design for a mobile game. Overall, they don't need to impress with the sound, but if they do, people will notice and I think it'll drive additional attention for people just to experience the immersion. I think in this era, sound production is such an essential part of both marketing and the actual experience for players, but it's often not given enough credit. In the previous CB2 trailer they produced, in my opinion, their use of sound production to match each section of footage they were aiming to present was an integral part of the selling point. Next up, UI. So Wuthering Waves UI did not stand out, but this can be viewed both positively and negatively. The structure strongly resembles the interface of Genshin with Tower of Fantasy font, which is able to achieve familiarity with players of these communities. It's easy for them to recognize, and it's a reduction of information overload, but it also lacks its own identity. So my personal preference generally views this positively because I'm more logical and functional, so I value the familiarity to make my rush to endgame more efficient. It's a smart choice in my eyes, but that doesn't mean it isn't a lazier approach. A trade-off between time spent and value gained is probably the best way to describe it. So UI elements can be unique and silky smooth and have its own identity, such as Arknight's Enfield's UI, but also would require much more creativity and innovation that maybe developers would not want to use resources on. So this one's up for grabs depending on your preference. I think it's okay for developers to take what they found successful from other games and improve on top of it to create what they want. Most of the gacha sphere uses the same base structure of UI and then adds artistic expression for the design of the game. No real difference for Wuthering Waves, it does have its own feel when browsing through menus, traversing dungeons, upgrading characters, fighting bosses, but the base template is still there. Overall, it's nice, but nothing stands out, and there are still some technical nuances that need to be smoothed out. Clicking actionable buttons sometimes has a noticeable delay that could be shortened. Transitioning between scenes is sometimes clunky and awkward with weird pauses, etc. These small things don't really take away from the experience though. They're just rough edges that I expect to be smoothed out on a full release. Next up, story. So currently the story is only voiced in Mandarin and the VAs are pretty nice to listen to. You'll probably hear familiar voices from games you've played before or anime you've seen before. Expect the other languages to appear on full release. So because I personally intend to play Wuthering Waves for its focus on gameplay, I did not really pay much attention to the story. It does have voice cutscenes, a plot, pretty characters, and so forth, the usual of what you'd expect. But it's CBT2, and I'm not fully diving into the game, and unless there's talk around town about it, I'm not going to pay too much attention. It's not that I don't care about the story, it's just that I care a lot more about their main selling point, which is combat, and it's the primary reason why I'm interested in playing. I have heard from some of my friends that they did significantly improve this story from CBT1, so take that as you will. For this reason, I don't feel qualified to make a judgment on the story, and it won't affect my experience slash review of this game. Also why this section is very short. Moving on to exploration. Mostly a thumbs up from me. Large open world, multiple areas, traversing on foot doesn't take that long, and there's really nice quality of life that makes the experience nice and not feel like a chore. Climbing turns into running up walls and doing backflips sometimes if there's a ledger below. You gain access to the grapple very early on, which is usually used on proper hooks with the T button depending on the location, but can also be used arbitrarily when running around. When it's used properly with the T button on something that you can use it on, there's no cooldown. But if you use it arbitrarily, like just while you're jumping, there's a 12 second cooldown. You can also dash in midair. Gliding is also a thing, and it doesn't drain too much stamina, so you can hang on for a while. All of these things make it pretty nice to roam around the world. I never truly felt impeded by the terrain. There was always a combination of quality of life that I could use to get where I wanted to, which was great. Generally for the world map, it has your stereotypical layout. Teleport waypoints, boss dungeons, resource domains, quest markers, points of interest in towns, like NPCs and stuff, the typical gacha layout. It also has its own version of puzzles, chests, world resources, as expected, and a wide variety of unique enemies. 
Personally, I felt that the enemies were a bit spread out, but traveling is fast so it doesn't feel too bad. I think it'd be nice to have a slightly higher quantity of enemies, maybe like a 20% increase to the whole world. They don't have to be guarding a chest or whatever, just existing for the purpose of farming that we'll talk about later would be nice. On the topic of exploration, there is a stamina system and it's called Waveplate. It's a 240 cap, which takes 24 hours to recharge, which means one per six minutes. Consuming for resources costs between 40 to 60, depending on what it is. And currently, there's no way to store it for future use. Overall, really good experience with the quality of life and making the world easy to traverse. Nitpicks about the enemy density, but that's like the only major thing besides obvious smaller bugs. Like sometimes you'll get stuck running on the side of the wall, but you don't actually lose stamina unless you cover distance. So you can just run in place until you give up and realize that you're not going anywhere. Kind of cute. These small bugs don't really affect my review because in my opinion, the devs should eventually smooth them out. World glitchiness is totally expected for a CBT, so it is what it is. The major features that are in the world are pretty solid. Now we'll get into the juicy topics that I personally have more interest in. To begin, we've got the most important system for any gacha game, how the summons work. So far, the base structure is near identical to Genshin, with some major improvements that we'll get to. 160 currency for one pull, 1600 for a 10 pull that guarantees at least one 4 star rarity, weapon, or character. Pricing of the currency is identical to Genshin, with 100 US dollars netting 6480 base currency, times 2 for the first top up, and then likely 8080 after the first bonus is used. Besides the first top up, on average, each 100 US dollars should get you 50 pulls worth of currency. It's expensive as hell, but my opinion for this doesn't matter. There's probably a reason the most successful and lucrative gadget game ever created is used as a reference for another game's purchase or summon system. If I were a dev, I'd use it and make personal improvements over it because it rakes in the cash. Here's what the banner rates look like. Character banner has a base rate of 0.8%, which is 0.2 higher than Genshin. Pity is at 80. Soft pity is currently unknown if there's any, and it's a 50-50 rate up. For a weapon banner, the base rate is also 0.8%, which is 0.1 higher than Genshin, with a pity at 80 again, and soft pity, currently unknown if any, and a 100% guarantee rate up. So the banners are treated equally with the same base rates across both. Only difference is the rate up chance. And yeah, if you notice, it's a really big feature. The limited weapon banner is guaranteed to be the rate up when you hit the five star. And the standard weapon banner has a selector that you can choose which five star you're targeting, and then getting a five star is guaranteed to be that one. So both weapon banners have no RNG involved, and worst case would take 80 pulls to get the one you want. If you get an early five star on the weapon banner like I did, boy oh boy does it feel really good. In my opinion, this is a really big change. Every single category of player benefits from this change, from whales going for R5 all the way down to pure F2Ps. The average cost of R1 to R5 achieves a drastic cost reduction at all tiers, and the most important thing is the variance of pulls required to get one is reduced. This means that while winning a 50-50 can feel really nice, that also means losing a 50-50 can feel horrible. So that horrible feeling is now no longer a part of the equation. It's now also reasonable to include a character signature weapon into a build calculation because it's way more within range of the average player's experience. Now let's head into the shop. The UI probably looks really familiar. Monthly subscription bundle, special bundles and a level up gift pack, which is quite nice. An exchange system like Stardust and Starglitter, a purchase tab, and a point store to exchange rewards from endgame content, which is a common thing among gadgets. Nothing really stands out here except one thing. In the item exchange, you'll notice that one of the things you can buy is GN's wave band. In Genshin terms, this would be equivalent to being able to buy Farina's constellations or any limited 5-star character. Yeah, crazy shit. Probably one of the most underrated features of this new shop system because this gives F2Ps and lower spenders and even whales a guaranteed goal of constellation buying. Now, this is only for the extra constellations or as they are called in Wuthering Waves, sequences. This is not purchasing the actual character. So while you probably can buy this even if you don't have the character, you won't be able to use them until you actually pull at least one copy of the character yourself, which is the first copy. This basically means that S1 or S2 of a limited character is a reasonable goal to achieve as an F2P or low spender of the game as long as you save up the currency after pulling over time. This is equivalent to being able to buy, for example, a Yellon C1 or Farina C1 and C2, just as an example. Those are basically the most notable and game-defining features that I've noticed for the summon system. Overall, incredible improvements over the core gadget system that most players are used to. 
But coming from someone who spends a lot on these games and makes content on it with my YouTube community, I still think that the price point is highway robbery. But it's still my job and I have gacha brain rot, so GG for me, I guess. Next up, character design. So this section is about gameplay design and not aesthetic design because those are two different things that character design could be referring to. In my opinion, Wuthering Waves has really solid character gameplay design. Each character has a unique set of about six abilities, including their E and their R. Basic attack chain, which is spamming left click. You have the heavy attack, which is the equivalent of a charge attack, which is holding left click. You have the E button, which is your skill or resonance skill in this game. You have R, which is your ultimate or resonance liberation. You also have something called an outro passive and an intro ability. These two combine to be called QTE. If you're familiar with Honka Impact, that's what it is. And then we also have a special passive that enhances a part of their kit, which is called a Forte Circuit. Each character can also wield one active echo ability, transforms them temporarily, and performs that echo's special ability. All of these things combine for an amazingly active playstyle that is unique to each character, and I love it. And if you're ever confused about how a character specifically works, there is a highly descriptive and dedicated tutorial for each character located at the bottom right of their main screen when you press C. Unfortunately, I was only able to find this for characters that I already own. I totally could have missed it, but as of recording, I wasn't able to find an archive of characters to try their tutorial or even for the limited GN. I think it'd be really nice to be able to try the character even if you don't own them, because it'll help decide if you actually enjoy playing them or not. Maybe they'll have a temporary tab for each limited banner, who knows, for example from Genshin. I'm only going to go over the basics of combat to help you guys get a feel for what's happening on the screen. More in depth and it'll be too overwhelming for this type of video. So. A couple things to make note of. Each character has their own ult energy circle. The bar at the bottom is the character's passive. These will differ in shape, size, and color between each character. During combat, you can freely switch between characters of your party with the number keys, but this won't normally activate the QT effect. When you hear the audio cue mid-combat, your party members have this visual effect near them. This indicates that QTE is ready. Swapping to a character triggers both the leaving character's outro passive and the incoming character's intro skill. Pretty cool. So now that that's been introduced, it's important to note in this game, there are two forms of energy. One for each character's ultimate, which is resonance energy, and one for the team's QTE, which is called concerto energy. Resonance is visible for each character, QTE, as far as I'm concerned, is not, but it'd be cool if it was. That's probably the quickest crash course I can give on character design for the purpose of this review. Overall, I can say I'm genuinely pleased with the diversity of playstyles and uniqueness of each character. It's way more complex than I thought it'd be, and I'm loving every second of it. Also, the tutorial for each character is heavily underrated. Lots of players that I've seen did not know about specific gameplay mechanics of the main character, called Rover, that's explained in the tutorial. Now I get it. Nowadays, we are all used to just going headfirst into everything and just learning as it goes. I'm at fault as well. No problem with that. Have your fun. Just reminding you that tutorials are your friends, not enemies. And very closely tied with character design is the overall gameplay experience of the game. This includes all the enemies you'll face over the course of your journey. I'm going to first do a little bit of mechanic explanation to get you guys up to speed on how combat works in Wuthering Waves. Then, I'll give my impressions on how they're implemented. First, even though there are elements in the game, there are no reactions. The game, I think, wants you to focus on just your mechanics and the boss mechanics. It's difficult enough. Second, on top of all the character abilities that you have access to, the enemies give you openings for two more things to keep track of. Perfect Evasion and Parries. Perfect Evasion happens when you dash or dodge any dodgeable attack, which is almost everything, granting you iframes for the entire rest of the attack that you just dodged. Parry occurs when you use attacks or abilities against an enemy while they have a golden ring indicating their next move. From my experience, not all attacks or abilities work to parry, so the specifics are still being ironed out. Perfect Evasion can be used against any attack, including parryable ones, but consumes stamina the same way dashing would. This is the default method of avoiding damage in this game, as there is a much lower risk of failing and taking damage. Parrying is much harder and stricter method of counterattacking the enemy. The main benefit is chunking the enemy's stagger bar by a set amount. When the stagger bar is completely drained, the enemy is crippled for a short period of time, lying stationary for you to deal damage. Now, there's a lot of nuance when it comes to parrying, including your distance from the enemy, 
the attack that you're using, and the angle that you're striking from. So yes, it's a lot more difficult, and failing the parry is more common than not, especially if you're still learning the fight. When you fail, you take damage like normal, which is typically fatal against more difficult enemies. These enemy mechanics make a fight very reminiscent of Souls-like games for slower, patient and tactical strategy are much more important than unga bunga autopilot the difficulty ramps up pretty heavily with mid to end game boss fights and we'll dive more into that in the next section you can basically view pairing as a level of skill issue associated with a particular enemy and the more experienced you are the more parries you'll be able to land so that's like a crash course on gameplay mechanics let's transition to applications within the game as you progress through the game various boss dungeons and resource domains are unlocked Resource domains to level up characters, weapons, and their materials are filled mostly with trash enemies in single to multiple waves and are expected to be cleared fairly quickly. World bosses and weekly bosses are single boss battles that have a fairly middle ground when it comes to mechanics. They're not that difficult and are a good training ground to test your basics. Upon reaching Union level 25, you can begin clearing tacit fields which are equivalent to artifact domains. We'll talk a bit more about this because there's a whole section dedicated to the ecosystem. Finally, Wuthering Waves has its equivalent Abyss and Simulated Universe in the form of Tower of Adversity and Elusive Realm. Tower of Adversity has time-limited challenges, and Elusive Realm is a roguelike dungeon giving you more and more buffs that are not part of the actual game. These features should all be fairly familiar to you guys, so there's nothing that structurally stands out. In my opinion, Wuthering Waves looks to have put much more emphasis on the actual combat itself rather than the features that contain that combat. So things like Tower of Adversity and Elusive Realm being a mirror of existing features from Genshin's Abyss and Star Wars Simulated Universe looks to me like the devs thought, wow, that was a successful feature from whatever game it was. Let's implement it with our own twist. Seems like a common trend of smart and efficient but lazy approach that allowed them to focus less on aspects they viewed weren't as important to innovate and focus on what they love to show off. Again, I'm personally fine with this approach as long as they capitalize on their combat. If the game is focusing this much on impressing their players with top-notch combat, I expect them to have an internal roadmap of innovative boss fights that we can look forward to as the game ages. If they don't, the existing boss fights will slowly get more stale and the challenging aspect of the game will fade and people will lose interest. As players, we will also naturally get stronger over time with farming gear and the release of new characters, even more trivializing the difficulty of the current content. So overall, my impressions of combat are strongly positive, but this is also a blessing and a curse. A strong first impression also means an expectation to perform. To conclude this gameplay section on a neutral, realistic note though, at the end of the day, a strong impression is still the best thing they could ask for. It'll keep players interested for a decent amount of time, and if they don't keep that expectation, players will just move on to the next thing. The cycle of gaming will continue. Okay, let's talk gearing, farming, and the ecosystem. This one's got a lot to unpack. So the ecosystem in Wuthering Waves is both the Pokedex farming and summoning in battle, and also the artifacts that your characters use to boost their stats. Quick crash course on these systems. Any monster that you kill in the overworld that is not a human NPC has a chance to leave behind a fragment of itself behind. You can absorb this as an echo and equip it for stats, upgrade it, etc. This is like picking up an artifact. Each echo has four rarities, green, blue, purple, gold, which determines its base stats, how many times it can be upgraded, 10, 15, 20, 25, and the maximum amount of substats it can have, 0, 3, 4, or 5. Each Echo and Independent Rarity grants a one-time amount of EXP for what's called a Data Bank. It's the first time that you get it. Data Bank is your Pokedex and has your rank that determines Echo Drop Rate and Max Rarity Echo you can obtain. Next tab, you can find Echo Gallery, which shows you what you have gotten and also allows you to track things you both have and haven't found. Very useful in upgrading this as quickly as possible to access rank 5 echoes, which are basically 5-star pieces. I'm unsure if there's a level requirement to get rank 5 echoes, because you would technically unlock this really early without advancing your union level that far, but it's still in your best interest to level up accordingly to access better and more efficient content. When you go to equip echoes, there's also a bunch of stuff you need to be aware of. You have total cost that begins at 8 from databank level 0 and increases to 10 and 12 at databank level 2 and level 9. This cost affects the type of echoes you can equip. So you have 5 total slots and each echo costs either 1, 3, or 4. 
Four cost are your crit rate, crit damage pieces. Three cost are your goblets, which are the elemental damage pieces. And one cost are percent stat pieces, so attack, defense, and HP. The top echo is the ability that is chosen. In battle, this is done with the Q button. Set bonuses exist as two piece, five piece, with five piece being pretty strong and worth committing to. Each piece that contributes must be a unique echo. For example, having two identical types of echoes will not contribute to the set bonus. The exception to this rule are shiny echoes called Phantom Blank. They are special and can coexist with their non-shiny equivalent to provide set bonus. These are available in the point store for clearing Tower of Adversity, Elusive Realm, and the Hologram bosses. Okay, so that's as fast of a crash course as I can give without spending a whole video talking about them and overwhelming you guys. Let's talk about the nitty gritty. All of the open world, including weekly and world bosses, can be farmed for echoes without using your stamina to claim the rewards. So this is especially apparent for weekly and world bosses. This is really nice. It means not only your world, but also friends' worlds and friends of friends and even random strangers, as long as they have an open world and allow you in to farm enemies and collect their echoes. You can still use your stamina to farm tacit fields, which provide echoes, EXP, and tuning materials, which we'll talk about. The type of mob will always be a set cost, so farming the world bosses will always grant you 4 cost echoes with the possibility of crit rate crit damage main stat. Same goes with the 3 cost and 1 cost, so you can easily catalog and mark which mob is what cost, map them out, and farm them to your heart's content. Because of this specialized farming, getting the specific main stat you want for whatever piece you want is easier in this game than in other games. Crit rate, crit damage, main stat 4 cost is way easier to achieve. Elemental damage 3 cost is still asked because it needs to be on set, but it's much more realistic. 1 costs are just attack, HP, or defense main stat with flat HP secondary, so they're really easy to farm for the main stat. Now that's the tip of the iceberg. Substats, on the other hand, are a whole other beast, and where a sickening amount of ridiculously RNG-dependent stuff happens. So hopefully, by this point, you understand that Echoes are artifacts, their cost represents their possible main stat, and Rarity determines base value, max level, and substat count. In Wuthering Waves, substats are completely blind when you first get an Echo. There's no starting substats. You also don't upgrade the substats. You have to upgrade the piece to see what the subset is. They start showing up at plus 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25. Also, the rarity has to be at least blue or better. How do you upgrade the piece? Well, you cannot use any of the other plus zero echoes in your inventory. You must use dedicated echo exp. If you want to use an echo to feed, that echo must already be leveled with some exp in it, and 25% of the exp it took is sacrificed. So, if you feed 500 exp into an echo, and then feed that echo to something else, it will only give 375 EXP, so it's a waste. Minus 125 EXP for nothing. This system is only really useful for feeding an old echo that you no longer use anymore and want to scavenge some EXP back. Otherwise, you'll be using dedicated echo EXP. In order to get echo EXP, they are stamina locked. You can either go to tacit fields for a minor chunk, or go to the dedicated resource domain that specifically gives echo EXP and tuning, both of which cost stamina. These dice that you see, called tuners, you need these to unlock the substats. So the substats don't just appear for free. So you have a blue, purple, gold echo at plus zero, because the green don't have substats, and you start upgrading. Plus five, 10, 15, 20, 25 are the thresholds where substats start appearing. What are the possibilities? Well, any stat that you can think of except element damage bonus. So that includes flat attack defense HP, percent attack defense HP, we also have basic, heavy, skill, and liberation damage bonus. You have crit rate, crit damage, and then you have energy regen. I may have missed some, but already that's 13 unique possible substat rolls. Oh, and I forgot to mention, this game allows you to roll the same substat as the main stat. It's actually pretty cool and a nice feature. So a crit rate main stat for cost can also roll crit rate substat for even more crit rate. When looking at those stats, usually a character that's DPS will probably want crit rate, crit damage, energy regen, their main stat of attack, defense, or HP percentage, and at least one source of basic, heavy, skill, or liberation for whatever their main source of damage is. So that's 5 out of 13 substats that are useful. Now, I don't know if these stats are evenly weighted, but the RNG is already starting to surface and it is pretty to spare. Now let's be realistic and say that we are okay with any of the five substats on the first two upgrades, not going to hunt specifically for crit rate damage. Because going for three to five of useful substats is insanity, which we'll get to. Ideally, you'd want to hit this by plus 10, otherwise the cost of upgrading will be depressing. 
So first two substats with something useful is about a 12.8% chance. It's not that bad. If you want three substats, which is plus 15, it's a 3.4% chance to get three substats that you would need for that character. Four substats, 0.7%. And the perfect five substats, which are all useful and no waste, 0.08%. Now, just as a disclaimer, this is an estimation. I don't know if there's more than 13 stats. I also don't know how the rolls are weighted. If crit rate, crit damage is less likely. This is all just to give a frame of reference to the infinite grind for a five perfect substat piece. So with those five perfect substats, all useful, no waste is roughly one in 1000. Assuming all 1000 have the right main stat you wanted in the first place. Honestly, that's not that terrible, right? Well, the substats themselves have a range of rolls. Currently in CBD2, the range of rolls from anecdotal data is estimated to be up to 4x. This means that the highest, for example, crit rate roll could be four times the smallest roll. Now, personally, it'd be nice if I could show you, but the only example that I have are two pieces, both with HP% percent substat, one with 5.2% and one with 14%. So this range is already almost 3x. Having this large of a range of substat values is pretty scary. For perfectionist and grinding players, the chase for these stats will be the real problem. Remember that in order to even see the substats, the piece has to be upgraded to multiples of 5. So a 5-star Echo will only show its 4th and 5th substats at 20 and 25. The amount of EXP that would take would easily clear your stamina for the day. And if you're trying to hit an important subset on those last two rolls because you have decent ones on the first three, if it doesn't hit, it really feels like a punch in the gut. So the combination of all of this feels like a speed run to burnout. Now, let's play devil's advocate and be way, way, way more realistic. Not every piece needs to have all the best substats, and they also don't need to be super high roll. They can just have one to two usable substats and move on with your day. We all crave crit rate crane damage because we have brain rot, but in reality, anything useful goes. I still find that the range of substats is still too large. Unless we are given explicit rates or just pretend we are oblivious, eventually players will catch up and realize, wait a minute, some of these rolls are way bigger than the others. If this substat system stays how it is, then aiming for one to three substats that you want at plus five, 10, and 15 will probably be the way to go. And then you'll just have to accept whatever 20 and 25 give. But this is also dependent on how difficult content becomes. Do we really need insane pieces or can we manage with mostly just main stats? If the content doesn't scale to the gear, then there will be less of a reason to grind super hard. There's a lot of nuance when it comes to this farming topic. Weathering Waves needs to consider the complexity of what they're trying to achieve and which audience they're trying to target. In its current state, upgrading Echoes is very expensive. From using Stamina to farm EXP and then RNGing the substat rolls and then RNGing the roll value. Does the average player have the time to commit farming multiple worlds for Echoes, or do they have to strictly rely on stamina? Currently, at Union level 30, the stamina to Echo conversion is 60 to 2 pieces. You get 240 per day or 8 pieces a day, assuming you spend all of it on Echo farming. If the average player, who only has time to burn their stamina, can get 8 pieces per day, they have way too many RNG walls to burn through for decent stats. Probably be trying to clear more of the difficult bosses, and for the less patient, they'll probably burn out of interest around this point. The hardcore player may be able to sustain the game cycle and is able to farm multiple worlds worth of mobs and bosses for more echoes, leading to 10 to 50 echoes farmed per day. But they still have to commit to farming EXP and probably if they're hardcore, they have harsher requirements for the pieces, meaning they'll throw away more pieces than the average player. And I understand that this infinite farming is probably the reason why plus zero echoes cannot be used for EXP because basically this would heavily reduce the stamina usage for that specific purpose, though you would still need to grind for the tuning dice. I don't know. Thinking like a developer, trying to wrap my head around the ecosystem and balancing its features around as many players as possible feels like a nightmare. This is definitely the end game loop of grinding if this is what we're seeing in CBT2. So I can see the perspective of both sides who think this is fine and people who think this needs a big rework. Because you can argue that the content doesn't need the substats if you have enough skill, which is totally valid, but people will still want to get the best pieces possible for the characters they like playing and continue to improve how quickly they can clear the hardest content. In order to prevent me repeating a bunch of stuff, I'll probably stop the yapping there for the echoes. Also, I apologize if this section is particularly confusing. The echo system is complicated by default, and I needed to simplify it as fast as possible to engage in a review about it. 
Overall, it's the most complicated system in the game. It's heavily RNG dependent, but it's also responsible for the endgame loop. So it's really, really important, but also so difficult to fine tune for the right feeling of the system. I feel like at the bare minimum, cutting the range of substat rolls would be a major step forward. Instead of being able to see 5.2% HP or 14%, which is my example, maybe something like 5.2 to 10.4. The largest roll being only twice as big as the smallest roll would feel a lot better. This is a crucial system in the game to fine tune as it directly impacts the combat experience in the game. So I hope a balance is reached where upgrading doesn't feel like a complete slot machine and there's a middle ground between time spent, stamina spent, and resources gained. All right, final dedicated section on the mid to end game bosses. I didn't want the gearing, farming, and echoes to be the final section because I didn't want the mixed vibes to be the lasting impression from the video. I overall still feel the game has strong potential. So for these bosses, they are specifically the hologram fights that unlock at Union level 27. Take all the world bosses that you usually fight for character ascension materials, but add progressively more difficult and aggressive movesets. Besides the bugs and sometimes weird and uncomfortable camera movements, these difficult bosses have excellent design. Each fight is completely different and is themed around the monster of the fight. The Heron has a bird themed moveset, the Memphis has a mutant superhuman move design, the Morning Ikes has supernatural dragon move designs, and Monkey is Monkey. Their movesets all have parryables and proper evasion techniques, so it's a hyper-focused test on your anticipation, reaction speed, and split-second decision-making. The more you fight the bosses, the better you get at them. Really enjoyable concept and great boss designs overall. Some important points of improvement though. Camera. Camera is almost great. Sometimes it has trouble following snappy movement, especially when the boss zips closely to your character's hitbox. These are the auto-lock camera features and I tried disabling them and playing with other settings, and it still makes it difficult to manually follow the quick moves. This is just my personal preference, and I think some people feel the camera is fine. In my opinion, having the camera adapt to the movement at a slightly slower speed would improve its fluidity and not cause super sharp switches consecutively. Second are general combat bugs. I feel that these will be fixed on release, so there's not really a point to bring them up in detail, so I'll just mention them. Perfect evasion not fully dodging an attack, so sometimes even post-dodge you still take damage, from surrounding hitboxes, and then taking damage after getting a successful parry depending on the enemy's hitbox also annoying. Both of these are taking extra damage at the cost of bugs. It might seem like a small issue, but remember, these fights are extreme challenges. Taking a hit is basically getting one shot or two shot. Third is retrying these bosses. So while there is a feature to press P that allows you to abandon the current challenge, it does not reset your character's HP or revive your downed party members. So, after abandoning the challenge, you'd still need to teleport to a major waypoint to heal your team and then come back. The current method to avoid this is to have the boss down every single one of your team members, causing you to instead fail the challenge. Failing the challenge will revive your entire team to full HP and zero energy and put you right before the challenge point, meaning you can instantly retry. Having to wait for the boss to incapacitate all your team members can sometimes take a while and is really just a waste of time. And since these are the bosses that are extremely difficult, players tend to spend hours redoing these fights over and over to achieve that one successful or perfect run. So it'd be a huge quality of life to see this implemented on the P button and allow us to instantly abandon and retry with full HP and zero energy. But besides that, I really enjoy these difficult boss fights. Hopefully you guys don't watch too many videos on the boss fights themselves, because the beauty of them is to experience and mold by yourself. And then, once you succeed, you can feel like a god gamer. That's the best feeling you'll get in a combat-focused game. So, overall, I personally think Wuthering Waves has a really solid foundation and incredible potential to take a portion of the gacha community by storm. Those looking for a technically intensive combat experience playing as anime guys or gals will probably find their best chance here, and let's hope that the momentum will continue beyond the initial release. From what I've currently experienced, I will 100% be playing the full release of this game, which hopefully we can expect in 2024, so expect lots of guides and challenge content to appear on this channel, and consider subscribing to the channel if you plan to follow along. I trust that the ecosystem will be modified to feel better balanced for progression. Otherwise, I'll grind as much as I can and enjoy as many of the boss fights as I can before burning out. If you somehow managed to watch this entire video, don't forget to drop a like and share with your friends, and drop a wooah in the comments, and what you're looking forward to for the game. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Take care.